Now, are the Catholic Church officials going to respond to all this stuff? Of course they are. They have to, right? They absolutely have to respond to all this stuff. And so they lead what is known as the counter reformation right let's double check on our time where we're going and where we're getting to right and then all right nice we can definitely cover this stuff like later on but still let's go ahead and go over this real fast okay so the catholic reformation is going to pop up and this is going to be called the counter reformation right the catholic church realizes under some subsequent popes who come up during the protestant reformation that we've got a real problem we have a problem because our faith is running people away, right? We have an issue because we've got Luther in Holy Roman Empire. He's now long dead, but still, he's causing us issues, right? Mm. We've got Henry in England. we got Calvin in Switzerland. And they're really destroying not only their money that's coming in, but also the solidarity of the Catholic faith, right? Then arrives Pope Paul III, right? Pope Paul III shows up. And he is going to encourage the counter-reformation. He encourages the Catholic faith to look internally, to look at themselves, and really kind of step back and be like, wow, we are the ones causing this. We are the ones creating this because of all the things that we've like kind of done negative this entire time, right? And he is going to separate himself from these Renaissance popes that came before him because he encourages reform. He discouraged the buildings of new churches, discouraged this idea of putting a million dollar fresco on the ceiling of every single one of them, discouraged the like idea of continually adding things to the Vatican City to just make them look more grandiose, right? So he supports the reforms of education to make sure that priests are being formally trained. He also supports strict clerical life. No more pluralism. No more priests getting into the priesthood or noble families putting their kids in the priesthood because they know it's going to be an easy job where they're going to make a lot of money, right? He said that no, clerical life should be again about those Benedictine rules of poverty, chastity, and obedience to the church. He believes in purging and cleansing the Catholic faith, and giving you the Catholic faith that exists now, the post-Reformation Catholic faith, right? And he establishes the holy office of the Roman Catholic agency to combat doctrinal heresy, right? Which is a really, really big thing uh, that I don't like about it. All right, so like, anyway, now, this is the one thing I don't like about Paul, all right? Pope Paul III did establish this concept of the Roman Catholic agency to combat doctrinal heresy, uh, where he basically creates a list of books that are banned for all Catholic people to read, right? Uh, the Praise of Folly by Erasmus ends up on it. Utopia by Sir Thomas More ends up on it. Pica Mirandola's 900 Theses ends up on it. Um, several other Calvinists writer of the Institutes of Christian Religion ends up on there. Writings of Luther end up on this list of banned books. I don't like that about Paul because he's not allowing them to read and decide on their own uh, because he's still encouraging masses in Latin. He's still encouraging Bibles only being written in Latin. He's not encouraging the list of vernacular things. But I do like how he is trying to fix things. Not every religious figure or every single historical figure is going to be perfect, right? Paul III did a lot of good stuff. Education reform, reform of the church, stop building up all these nice things. We are not here to make money, but then he's also like, but I don't want you reading stuff. Like, I don't, I don't like that, right? But he is still a very all-important figure, right? And only, he, and he also kind of kept the Inquisition around. Like, so the Inquisition, of course, being the church court to try people who are heretics and possibly see them burned at the stake, right? Now, however, he did speak out against a lot of the death sentences and things like that. And he was saying that we need to kind of like <laughs> tamp that down a little bit. Um, and he also encouraged the Catholic Church to be the leaders of the Inquisition instead of like the Spanish Inquisition that happened over in Spain where they're like, are you sure you're not Jewish anymore? Let me see you eat this bacon. Like, and like all this other crazy stuff, right? But the big place he does this at is the Council of Trent, right? Which is a several times Times meeting idea. And as you can see, he was doing this when Calvin was still active and alive. Was he alive still? I don't think he was alive, actually. I think he died in like 15, 15, 
Uh, 64, yeah. All right, so yeah, he was still alive. Um, so yeah, the during his lifespan, during the lifespan of uh, John Calvin, the Council of Trent begins to meet. And the Council of Trent has major successes where they discuss all these things that Pope Paul once performed, right? From 1545 to 1563, they meet multiple times. And it's these huge meetings of cardinals and the Pope discussing the issues raised by these reformers, right? Some major successes, they outlaw the sale of indulgences, right? That's huge. Not necessarily the biblical indulgences. They don't say that you can't do good deeds and also take some time off your purgatory, but they outlaw the sale of indulgences. So but the make the sale of indulgences illegal. They reject the cons uh, which stinks. They like do do this and I don't <laughs> do do. Uh, they do this and it drives me nuts. They reject the salvation by faith idea, which is a Lutheran concept, like because by being in your faith, you know what I mean, you can then also go to heaven. So they still retain the sacraments list, which is a little annoying personally. Um, so, well, actually, that's not true. It's something that it's just different. It's not annoying. It's just different. I was just raised Protestant. It's just different. I, I respect it. I respect it. I get it. Now, anyway, but they're also going to acknowledge corruption of the clergy, right? They're going to acknowledge that some of these clergies are have, clergy members are having illegitimate kids. They're going to acknowledge the idea that, like, you know, some of these clergy members need to be brought up on reform. So they're actually trying to work to fix that and use the Inquisition to even hunt down their own clergy that are violating these rules. They're going to begin to bring women in as well to help educate children, right? They're going to help get women to create some of the first Catholic schools, right? No! Like, to actually create, like, the nuns and the sisters would be brought in to help educate children in the ways of the Catholic Church, right? They're also going to create new orders, right? And the new orders are going to be very important. We're going to talk about those. Put a little star next to those new orders, right? We're going to talk about two of them, okay? Now, they are going to have some failures, though, too. They did not attempt to reconcile with Lutherans, which really stinks. They kind of just said, well, Lutherans will be Lutherans, right? And Lutherans are going to be over there. And if any Catholic country like acknowledges or accepts Lutheranism, then they and themselves are sinning. And they, So he could have done a little bit better about that. And the Council of Trent could have done a little bit better about that. But he also like just only acknowledged their existence, which is really annoying. Same thing with the Calvinists too, right? Acknowledge that they're just there, right? And some of these new orders are going to pop up though. We're going to see new orders of priests, right? Because you've had some priests that have existed since the Middle Ages, right? Franciscans, Benedictine monks, like all these other groups of people. But the big goal of these new orders is going to harp on the education of priests and people, right? To spread the faith using education, right? Teach them mathematics and about Christ, all right? So like this is a big deal. And one of the biggest ones that was created was the Ursuline Order of Nuns, right? Which is, of course, what Ursuline Academy is named after. I know some of you are like, Ugh, but still, all right, it's very, very important. The Ursuline Nuns were an order of nuns founded by Angela Merici, not Medici, but Merici, which concentrated on the education of young women to raise the collective intelligence of a household. Christine de Pizan and Isabella de Esti would be so proud by this. They're basically trying to harp on the idea of educating young women to have smart women. If you have smart women who make smart mothers, smart mothers make smarter children, right? Smarter children make better attributes to the Catholic faith, right? So the Ursuline nuns are going to be a major one, but this is the biggest one. The Society of the Jesuits. Again, what Jesuit high school is named after. Founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, right? St. Ignatius of Loyola encourages education above all things, right? Helps spread Christianity and humanist thought, like actual Renaissance ideas, right? To place it in the Jesuits, take it upon themselves to spread the Catholic faith and education to places like Japan, India, Brazil, North America, the Congo, they spread faith and intelligence all over the place, right? And where did this all come from? Because St. Ignatius of Loyola himself was a former soldier, actually. He was actually a soldier before he actually entered into the priesthood. And while he was a soldier, he had actually been wounded in battle, right? And since he was stuck inside of a cast and on a bed for so long, he was like, you know what? I've got to figure out, I can't exercise my body right now, so what I'll do is I'll exercise my faith, right? And he would read a certain number of psalms every day. He would read a certain number of, like, uh, Latin, uh, Latin. what are they called? Uh, parables every single, I'm not a parable, I don't know. There's a psalm, there's other things. All right, so he would read a bunch of those every day. Verses, all right, so they would, he would read a certain number of verses every day as, like, his exercise program, right? And I'm going to do 30 flexes, and I'm going to read 30 verses. And then I'm going to do 30 push-ups, and I'm going to read 30 psalms, right? It's a very bro -y kind of thing. And big thing about it why they're so important is your boy Francis himself is a Jesuit right so like a Jesuit 
monk. All right, so the big thing about it is these orders still exist and they still permeate our society and they are products of the Counter-Reformation. And with our bad boy Francis, I will literally tell you straight up, I love this guy. I think he's awesome. I imagine he drives a white Harley all the time and is just like throwing holy water bombs at people because the man, I actually saw him in Philadelphia. He's a really good guy. Very, very big fan of the Pope. Uh, but anyway, so on that note, I'll talk to you guys later. Y'all have a good one.